Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be around the world. Uh, my name is Jonathan, and welcome to today's online workshop. Um, as you are joining, please do let us know in the chat where you're joining us from, and maybe give me an idea of what time of day or night it is there. Um, it is about 4.30 p.m. my time. Um, and the weather today is cold and wet. <laughs> we are we are hitting spring in Cape Town, uh, and that means we have weird weather where it is cold one day and hot another. Uh, but today is a cold and wet day. Um, so if you've never joined one of these sessions, let me introduce myself very quickly. Uh, my name is Jonathan. As I've mentioned, I'm from Cape Town in South Africa. Uh, I am a developer educator at Automatic. And I am sponsored to work with the training team. Uh, the training team are the folks that create content for Learn WordPress. We create tutorials, we create courses, we create these online workshops, create and host these online workshops, um, and just generally keep learn learnwordpress.org going and running. Um, if you are a regular of one of these Thursday sessions, uh, it's good to see you again. I want to make a special thank you to Stephen Anders, who was hanging out in the waiting room when I started this session a bit early. Uh, so thank you, Stephen, for coming back. Uh, if this is your first time, welcome. Um, and as I say, let us know in the chat where you're joining us from. We have, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, but I'm guessing it's Jose uh, from Sacramento, California. We have James from, uh, James says, greetings, James, I recognize from my live stream. So welcome, James. We had some interesting chats about um, businesses and paid plugins and all kinds of things in my live stream on Tuesday. So welcome James from Boston. Welcome Arta from Frankfurt. Good to see you again, Arta. Um, Frankfurt, Germany. Germany is a country I really need to travel to again. I've been there once. Um, Jose says, it's 7.30 a.m. in the morning. Jose, I really respect someone who joins an online workshop that early in the morning. So I hope you have some coffee or drink of choice ready. Um, and I hope that you enjoy today's session. All right, while folks are joining, uh, I'm going to I'm going to get things going with a few announcements as I may have mentioned earlier we are doing we are talking today about the metadata API um, and we're going to be diving a little bit into what that is and how it works in a second uh, Kavya from Pune India welcome uh, it's 8 p.m here 26 degrees but it feels like 34 yikes um, I have been to Pune once uh, I traveled to India a number of years ago and we went to Bangalore and we went to Pune so I know where that is um, more or less. <laughs> um, and I know how warm it does get there. Um, hi, Mark uh, from Issaquah. Uh, Sharon says, I trust you have recovered. Sharon, yes, thank you for asking. Um, Sharon is asking about the fact that I, A, was sick a few weeks ago and then B, injured my back. Um, I'm all recovered from that. I'm feeling 100% good. Uh, so thank you for, for asking that question, Sharon. Okay, a couple of announcements before we continue. First of all, again, welcome to everybody. Uh, if this is your first time, or if you've been to a few of these before, you are welcome here today. Um, I don't have a co-host with me today. Kind of my own fault in a way. Um, the, the person who offered to co-host uh, was still available to co-host, but then I had to move the session and it's his last day at his current company. So he's not able to make it today. Um, so please bear with me while I am monitoring the chat and admitting folks as we continue with the session. Um, if I if I have to break and do those things. Um, please let me know if you can't see my shared screen. So you should see right now an announcement slide with the title announcements across the top. Please let me know if you can't see that because sometimes we have problems with the screen share and then I can just re-enable that. As always in these sessions, we are presenting in what's known as focus mode. Focus mode means I can see all of your video feeds if you enable your video, uh, but you can't see each other. Uh, and that's just to prevent any instances of Zoom bombing, which we have had in the past. Um, you are welcome to enable your video if you would like to. You're welcome to leave it off as well. It's off by default, and you're welcome to leave it that way. But if you feel like enabling it, you can do that as well. Um, you are welcome to ask questions at any point in time. You're welcome to post them in the chat or unmute to ask questions. Um, the only thing I ask is if your question isn't specifically related to what we're talking about at the time, please keep it for, I do leave breaks, uh, logical breaks as we continue along. So please keep it for that break or just post it in the chat and I'll come back to it um, when we get a chance. Um, Sharon, it's all good, thanks. Um, I, I, I should be good. 
but maybe keep that in mind. And if you see a, a future workshop coming up and you want to co-host, let me know. Uh, but I should be good for now. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, then, if you would like to code along with me today, make sure you fired up your local install, um, be it local WP or whatever you're using. Uh, if you're like me, it's it's up and running all the time. But if you need to, to start it up, start the application up or anything like that, please, please do start getting that together now. Um, if I start speaking too fast, please do give me a shout, pop me a message in, in the chat or unmute and say, Oi, Jonathan, slow down. Um, I do tend to speak fast when I get excited and I'm excited about what I'm teaching or presenting. Um, so sometimes I can rattle off and rush off and, and leave people. So please slow me down. If there's anything on screen that I'm jumping away from too quickly and you want me to put it back on screen, any code or anything like that, or any links, I'll share the links in the chat. You're welcome to ask for those things. I will be checking the, the chat and keeping an eye on what's happening there. Um, as always, the session is being recorded and will be posted to WordPress TV afterwards. Um, and I'm just going to check that it is recording. I, yes, I did start the recording. Um, and then if you're looking for more WordPress tutorials, courses, online workshops, you can find those at learn.wordpress.org. And if you're looking for any specifically developer news and blog updates, I can recommend checking out the new core developer blog at developer.wordpress.org slash news. I'm going to share that in the chat now. Um, it's a new blog that, that the WordPress project launched a few months ago, and it's all kinds of fun and interesting things that go on there. Um, one of the one of the more recent posts that I I don't think it's live yet, but I think it is coming, um, is Nick Diego is is writing a blog article on um, creating block variations, which I'm looking forward to reading. Um, so keep an eye on the WordPress developer blog for all kinds of WordPress developer goodness. All right. Um, our learning outcomes today, as mentioned previously, we're going to be focusing on the metadata API. We're going to learn what it is and why it's useful. Um, we're going to learn how to access the metadata in the WordPress dashboard, better known as custom fields. Um, we're then going to look at how to use the API to interact with the metadata, how to add, delete, update. Um, and there was another one, add, update, delete. Oh, and fetch. <laughs> I forgot there for a second. And fetch metadata to be used on the front end or wherever. Um, and then we're going to dive very briefly into what I call the metadata wrapper functions. I'll explain what those are when we get there. Um, we're not going to have time to go into all of the metadata functions. This is very much an introduction to the metadata API. Uh, but hopefully I'll be able to give you enough information so you can go further um, and start digging into the documentation. Before we get going, um, I would like to ask you to please, in the chat, on a scale of one to five, one being you you know almost nothing about this topic, you've maybe never heard of the Metadata API before, to five being you you know you are the Metadata API king or queen, you know everything about it, you, you live and breathe Metadata uh, functions. Let me know in the chat what your knowledge level is on this topic, just so I get a feel for, for where we are. Um, myself, I discovered, I, I thought I was a five, I'll be honest, I thought I was a five before I started preparing the session. Um, and then I learned some things in the process. So I would call myself a, a good four at the moment. There's always something new to learn. Um, it's one of the reasons I love my job so much, because I get to go and learn these things and share it with you folks. But uh, I would consider myself a four on the Metadata API. Okay. Um, Sharon says she's a solid three. Alex is a one. Jose is a two. James is a one. Jim is a three, Andrew Slay says two, Mark says three, Kavya says two, and Peter says two. Okay, so we've got a good, nice middle ground here. Um, most folks who are developing with WordPress, who are making plugins and themes, will at some point discover the Metadata API. Um, a lot of folks who are building sites are using things like advanced custom fields, which uses the metadata API. So a lot of folks do know about it and do use it on a regular basis. So I hope that there is something today that you discover, uh, or if not, maybe it's just a good refresher for how all these things work. All right. Um, very quickly, let's just run through the requirements. If you want to work along with me today, or if you're watching the recording of this session and you want to try out the code samples I'm going to be sharing today, you will need a local WordPress install. You will need some kind of text editor. I use VS Code. You will need to be able to access your database. And that's only really just to see the data being stored in the database. Um, if you have something like AdMiner or phpMyAdmin or one of those things, that will work. If you don't, there's also a plugin you can install called SQL Buddy. Um, it currently does say on the SQL Buddy website that it hasn't been tested up to the most recent version of WordPress. 
Um, that is because the company that acquired the plugin, the company that acquired Delicious Brains, which is WP Engine, they have uh, stopped maintaining the plugin. Uh, I'm not sure the reason for that, but the plugin does still work. I still use it in these sessions. Um, so that's one you can you can check out. Um, then you might want some post data. If you have a default WordPress install that will that will install with one post. If you want to create more than one post, you can use this plugin called Fakerpress. Um, this is a plugin that I personally use. I, I'm not a I'm not a fan. I'm not a friend or a promoter of this plugin. I'm not. I don't make any money of this. I just found it. Somebody recommended it to me a number of years ago. It's a great way for creating a, what's known as dummy dummy posts or dummy pages in your WordPress site. Um, and I use it quite regularly. I'm not going to be using it today. I'm just going to be manually creating some some posts. But this is a good one to use if you need to just quickly create posts or pages in your WordPress site. Um, and then we're going to be working in what I call a testbed file. So in other words, it's a file that is separate from the WordPress install. We're going to create it ourselves in the root of a WordPress install. Um, but it, it loads the core WordPress functionality, but not the rest of the page request. And we can use that to test out uh, WordPress functions. And so the file that I'm going to use, I have created this um, GitHub. I don't know if it's GIST or GIST. You know, GIF, GIF, I don't know, but there it is. Um, and what you can do is you can take this PHP code. It's actually a combination of PHP and HTML code. You can pop it into a PHP file in the root of your WordPress install, and then you can browse to that file and test things out. So I'm going to do that now quickly. I have my learn press site set up uh, on this local URL learnpress.test. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to open up virtual VS code, virtual code, VS code. I'm going to browse to the folder that houses uh, my sites. I'm going to find the learn press site and I'm going to open that up in VS code. And then inside the root of the word of the learn press install, the WordPress install, I call it learn press, whatever, where the index.php file sits and all the other sort of primary core WordPress files, I'm going to simply click on the bottom here and say new file. And I'm going to call it wp-test.php. So that's a PHP file. And then I'm simply going to copy this content out of the gist or gist, whatever the right pronounce. I guess it would be gist because it's GitHub, not GitHub. <laughs> so I guess it's a gist. Um, and I'm going to paste that code in there. And what this does is this loads the wp-load.php file, which is a WordPress core file that loads the database engine, it loads all the sort of core WordPress functionality. And we can do things like call the get option function to get the name from the database and those kind of things. Um, and that's that's what we're going to use today to test out our metadata API functions. So with this file created, if I browse to learnpress.test forward slash wp hyphen test.php, um, the first time I do this, it might break. It's a weird bug. I'm, okay, it hasn't broken today. So there it is, learn WordPress, and it says, hello, learn press. It's getting the learn press from the database. So I know this is all working. So that's the file we're going to be working in today. We're not going to be building any plugins or themes or anything because we're really just experimenting with the code as opposed to building something. All right. I'm going to take a break there. If anybody else is busy doing that on their side, grab a sip of coffee, pause for any questions. Otherwise, we will dive into what is metadata and why we want to use it. All right. So if, you, <clears throat> excuse me, if you browse to developer.wordpress.org and you scroll down about halfway and you click on the utilize APIs link under the common APIs, you can click on either common APIs or utilize APIs, both will work. That will take you to the common APIs hand. And pretty much every single API that we've been covering under the common API section is listed on this page. Um, you will see that metadata is the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eighth item on the list. And if we click on that, there is a page in the Common APIs handbook about metadata. Um, and so the metadata API is a simple and standardized way for retrieving and manipulating metadata of various WordPress object types. Metadata for an object is represented by a simple key value pair. Um, objects may contain multiple metadata entries that share the same key and differ only in that value. Now, that's a whole bunch of words, which if you've never seen it before, may or may not make sense. So let's have a look in the database so that we can understand that a little bit better. 
my local WordPress install or my local WordPress development environment, should I say, uses PHP my admin. So that's what I'm going to be doing to look into my database. Um, here is my LearnPress site. Here is my WP posts table. So I'm going to click on that. Actually, I'm going to click on the structure tab so that we can see the, the columns in this table. Um, and the column names are all listed down the left-hand side here. So we've got an ID column. Let me zoom in a little bit so it's a little bit bigger. Um, oh, why is it not zooming now? Let's go, yeah, 125, there we go. There is an ID column, a post author column, a post date column, post HGMT, post content, post title, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and if you've never seen a database table before, this is how database tables works. You have columns with names, and then you can store different type of data against those column names. That's great, but the problem comes in if you want to be able to store additional data about a post, for example. So let's say you're building a site and you're, you're building a recipe blog, for example. And every single post is going to have some kind of, let's say, mood, or let's say some kind of fragrance or flavor, flavor palette, let's say. I don't know much about recipe blogs, as you may have noticed. Um, and you want to store, let's call it a flavor palette. Um, and you want to store this, or maybe, maybe a better option is a cuisine style. So we've got different cuisines from around the world. And you want to be able to store that cuisine style against the recipe blog post. There isn't a field in the post table where you can store something about the cuisine style because that is very custom to the type of site you're building. That's where the metadata come in, come, comes in. Um, the, the description, when you, when you look up uh, what metadata is, if you look up like a dictionary definition for metadata, metadata is essentially data about data. So when we store metadata about a post or other data objects in the WordPress site, we store it about those posts. Um, so the other example I was thinking of when I was putting this together is let's say I'm writing a travel blog and I travel to different cities around the world. And for every blog post that I write, I want to be able to include a location stored against that post um, and maybe a secondary location. So maybe I want city um, and I want uh, state or I want country or whatever the case may be. I can't store those locations against the post based on the fields in the database. So that's where I would use metadata. So as an example, let's say I go to my first post here, which is the hello world post as a post ID of one. I can then store in the post meta table, I can store a new record and I can say, uh, I can leave the meta ID as one. I can say the post ID is one because that's the post it belongs to. I can give it a key of location. And then let's say for the value, I want something like New York, whatever the case may be. Sorry, can't spell today. Um, and then I'll go down to the bottom here and I will hit go in my PHP, my admin. And that is now inserted the record into the post meta table, uh, location New York. And it's tied it to that post ID because I've stored the ID of one there. Now that's all well and good, but where would I see this information? Well, that's one of the cool things about WordPress is WordPress includes a default set of user interfaces that you can actually see and create this information. You don't have to dive into the database. It's something that's been around for a while. So let's pop over into my site before we get into this test bed. Um, and we go into WP admin. And I'm going to go over to my posts. I'm going to click on the hello world post. And I'm going to enable in the block editor something called the custom fields panel. So if I click on the three dots in the block editor and I click preferences, panels and enable custom fields. That'll ask me to show and reload the page. And then when I do that, there we will see location at the bottom and there is the value stored of New York. Um, and then from this interface, I can also create additional custom fields. So let's say I want to make another custom, uh, custom field location and I want to make it New York State, for example. Or maybe a better option is, actually, let's make this one New York State for now. Uh, trust me to pick the one that has the same name as the city as the state. And I can say, uh, enter new, actually, no, sorry, add custom field. And there we go. So now I've got location New York, location New York State, for example. And if I view that in the database, there, location New York, location New York State, those have been added. They both have, they both have the post ID of one. The location is the key. The value is the value. So notice a few things. Number one, 
I always need a post ID to associate the meta keys to the core data object. Number two, I can have multiple keys with the same key. Sorry, multiple fields, multiple meta fields with the same key. So I can have a location multiple times with different values. I can also have unique keys. So I could change the first one to city if I wanted to, and the second one to state, for example. That would make it easier to manage. But I'm not bound by any specific structure as I am with the post table. With the post table, I must store certain fields on certain, sorry, certain values on certain fields. I must store a title in the post title. I must store the content in the post content. So metadata is a lot more flexible, but that also means you need to be more aware of what's going on. Notice in the post table, if I look at the structure, the post author, for example, has to be an integer. In this case, it's what's called a big int, but it has to be an integer. So I can't store a string value or a Boolean value or anything like that in that field that has to be an integer. Whereas in the meta tables, if we look at the structure, um, the key is a, what's known as a var char or a variable char with a maximum limit of 255 characters. So that's quite big. And the meta value is something called long text, which pretty much means any type of text can go in. So I can store a string. I can store numbers as text. I can store URLs to uh, images, uh, to audios. I can store what's known as a serialized object. So I can take an array and I can serialize it and store it in there, or I can take an object and serialize it and store it in there. I can store pretty much anything that I want in there. So it has a large amount of flexibility. Okay. So why am I showing you all this? Well, the functionality that powers, let's go back to the post, that powers this meta box here, this custom fields area, is the metadata API. The core functions that make this possible form part of the metadata API. So when I create here, when I say add new custom field, um, let's actually take this one. Let's, let's make this one. Let's change these. Let's go uh, Los Angeles, for example. And let's make the state California. And if I click update there, it's calling a metadata API update function. And if I click update there, it's calling the same function with certain pieces of data. And now that data has been saved. If I refresh this, there it is displayed. And if I check it in the database, there the values are updated in the database. So what we're gonna be looking at today is those functions that underlie this functionality. The other thing I wanted to mention before we do that is that this custom fields area um, is known as a custom fields meta box, meaning it's working with metadata. It is also possible to develop your own custom meta boxes. So if you've never seen this before, this is the, the link into the documentation that shows you how to do that. That is unfortunately outside of the scope of this tutorial. Uh, I'm planning a future tutorial on how to work with meta boxes and how they can be used and the functionality of them. But if you want to dive into that after the session, I do recommend going and checking that out. Okay. Um, James says, I was about to say I was nervous about entering and moving about in PHP admin. Um, that's the beauty of doing it on a local site that doesn't matter, James, is you can break things and if it falls over, you just reinstall WordPress. <laughs> uh, but yes, I, if you don't feel comfortable making those changes, I do understand. Um, and then you say, I was about to ask, where do those custom fields come from? Yes, so the custom fields functionality that exists in WordPress is, depending on what kind of WordPress uh, you're using, it will be enabled in different ways. If you're using uh, the block editor, which is the one that looks like this, it's the, in the newer versions of WordPress, since I think it is WordPress version five, then as I showed you, you click on the options dots, you go to preferences, panels, and then enable custom fields there. If you are in a classic editor environment, so I have got a classic press uh, site set up. Uh, this could either be, you've got the classic editor plugin installed, that is, this plugin over here, or you're using some other way to, to get the classic editor working. If you go into your post um, and you click on the screen options at the top, you'll see custom fields is listed there. If you click on that, then the custom fields will show at the bottom of the screen. Okay. Right. Any questions on how all that sort of looks and how to access it and how sort of what metadata is and why it might be useful before we actually dive into the the metadata functionality and how it works. I'm gonna leave that on the screen. No, not that one. That one.
Darren's keen to go. Let's dive in. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So the one thing I wanted to mention is when you enable the custom fields meta box at the bottom of a post, there actually is a custom fields link at the bottom here. It says custom fields can be used to add extra metadata to a post that you can use in your theme with a link to assigning custom fields. So you can go and read that as well if you would like. I'll actually share that in the chat. Um, and then we can do some we can do some diving. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to create a second post. Um, and I'm going to just say something simple like howdy. Um, and this is my post. And then I'm going to publish this post so that it gets an ID. I could have saved a draft as well. That would have worked. If you, There's a couple of ways you can get your post ID. The one way is usually the post ID is the, the numeric value in the query string. So post equals seven. So seven is the ID. That's one way you can do it. The other way you can do it is if you pop into your database and you go to your post table, and you search for or look for your post. Um, let me just, sorry, let me just move that out of the way. It will be the one that is that has got the post title with the status of publish. That will be the post ID. So there you just see it's ID seven there. But I find the easiest way to do it is to get it from, where is it now? Get it from the URL. There's always a, a post value there and there is ID seven. So I'm gonna copy that into my memory now so that I want that ID seven. I'm then gonna hop on over to my test bed and I'm going to remove the echo hello site name bit and I'm going to remove the get option bit and the first piece of code that I want to introduce you to is the add metadata function so to find that I'm going to go back to the developer documentation I'm going to click on the code reference link which takes me to the list of all the functions and classes and I'm going to search for add metadata. Um, and here is the documentation page on add metadata. So the great thing about the WordPress documentation is it gives you the function signature. In other words, what the function looks like and what parameters it accepts. It gives you the list of parameters. Uh, it tells you what data will be returned from the function, shows you the source code of where it exists, and then any user contributed notes that exist underneath that, uh, which often will have example code that you can use. So the add metadata function has four required parameters. One, two, three, four. The first one is the meta type. So the type can be post, comment, term, or user. And that is because if you have a look at your database, uh, you will see that a WordPress database has metadata uh, tables for those four data objects. So posts has the post metadata table. Terms has the term metadata. Terms would be your categories or your tags. Um, users have user meta. And comments have comment meta. So if ever you're working with any one of those four data objects and you need to store or retrieve additional data on them, you can create meta for them. And it all works in the same way. Uh, let me close that and go back here. So the first one is the object. The second one is the object ID. In this case, the post ID. And our post ID is ID seven. Um, the next one is the key. So that's the value you want to store as the key for the metadata. And the fourth one is the value. So that's the value you want to store. So to be able to do what we did in the custom fields programmatically on this post, we would simply do the following. We would say add metadata. And then we would pass in post. We would need to pass in the ID, which we said for our case was ID seven. It'll be whatever your post ID is on your site. Then the key, I'm gonna work with the same key we worked with earlier, which is location, and then the value. So in this case, I'm gonna go with some more California places and I'm gonna go with San Diego. Um, and then the add metadata function, if we look at what it returns, it returns either the meta ID. So in other words, let me go back to the post meta field this ID value for the record in the metadata, or it returns false if something goes wrong. So if you've passed something incorrectly through or you can't add metadata for that post ID, it will return false. So a good thing to do with this information is to do something like this and to say uh, meta ID equals add metadata. Now, more strict software developers might complain about the fact that it can return either an integer or a Boolean. Um, that's an argument I agree with. 
in some respects and disagree with it in others. It's the way it is. So I've learned to work with it. Um, but what you can do now is you can do something like this. You can say if metadata ID, um, meaning if a, if a valid value is returned. So if we get an ID one back, then we can say something like um, echo meta data record added with ID and then the meta ID. And then we can say else, which means if it's a if if there's not a valid value or it returns false, in other words, something's gone wrong, we can say echo uh, error occurred or something like that. Um, because this is just a test, it doesn't matter too much what we do, but that is what your code looks like. So it's add metadata, type add in the sorry, pass in the object type, the object ID, the metadata key, the metadata value. Okay, I'm going to copy this code out and pop it in the chat. James, I saw your comment there. I will get to it in a second. But let's see what this does on the front end. So let's go back to our, have I got the test bed open? No, I don't think I do. So let's close down some tabs here. Let's close that. Let's leave that and that there. Let's close down that one and let's open up the test bed again. Um, there it is. And now if I hit enter, it's going to run that code. And there it says, metadata record added with ID of nine. So that sounds like everything went well. If I pop on over to the post meta table and refresh it, there it is, ID nine. It's created a, a metadata ID on post ID seven with location San Diego. And we can verify that by refreshing this post, either just hitting refresh in the browser or hitting enter on the address bar. And we should see, there it is, there we've got location and San Diego in the in the custom fields panel so we know that's worked okay james says my brain is already thinking this metadata custom field option helps with the taxonomy of a post right good for organizing and maybe even seo perhaps so get say a government site with large archive jose says you can use meta field to store a term of a taxonomy on the post but this won't create the relationship between the post and the taxonomy then if you need to query you won't be able to use the tax query and you'll need to use the meta query instead. And that's exactly correct. Um, so if you want to use things for uh, for taxonomies of posts, use the built-in categories and tags. Um, I'm, I'm planning on doing a session on, on the taxonomies in WordPress one day soon, but the short of it is, is that categories, I'm trying to remember now, categories can have parent categories, but tags can't, or something along those lines. There is a difference between the two. I can't remember it offhand now. But if you want to categorize things, rather use categories and or tags, those are your taxonomies in WordPress. What I tend to use metadata for is when it's just, I need to store additional data on something. So a good example would be a membership site. You might want to use your users as your members, and you might need to store their addresses or their contact details, where they're located, um, possibly what courses they've passed or whatever the case may be, that's where you might use uh, metadata. All right. Any questions on adding metadata programmatically? Um, private data is a good option. Yes. Uh, just note, though, that your metadata fields are not. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, <laughs> I say hashed. Hashed is the wrong word, but they're not. Um, uh, what is the word? Uh, they're, they're stored in plain text. So if you want it to be really private, you don't want somebody to hack it, you might need to do some kind of hashing yourself. Um, they are stored in plain text, so just be aware of that. Okay. So who can guess what the function would be to up, if, if add metadata allows us to add metadata, who can guess what the function would be to allow us to update metadata? Anybody? <laughs> See if, see if anybody wants to take a guess in the chat. Fast, fastest fingers first. <laughs> okay, Elliot says update metadata. Elliot, you're exactly correct. Um, so one of the things I love about WordPress is things are fairly straightforward. You know where to start and you know what can go from there. So update metadata is the function to update metadata. Um, <laughs> Jose says WordPress developers are very semantic about this, 100% correct. And it takes exactly the same parameters. So it requires the meta type, the object that we're updating. It requires the object ID, 
It requires the key and it requires the string. It also has an additional optional value called previous value or prev value. And this, if you specify it, it will only update the existing metadata, metadata entry with this value. Otherwise, update all the entries. Now, the reason this exists is because, as I mentioned earlier, if we look at the metadata for post ID one, you can have multiple metadata key value pairs using the same key. So you could store location four or five times. And then when you call update, you need to say to it, well, I only want to update, for example, the one that is location Los Angeles, not the one that is location California. And then it will only update the one that's location Los Angeles if you pass in that previous value. For our purposes, we can keep it super simple. I want to update the location from San Diego to something else. So in my code, I can just say update metadata. It's the same post, the same ID, the same key. This time I'm going to go with San Francisco, for example. Uh, so San Francisco, there we go. Um, you will notice that, uh, let's go back to the function. Uh, it returns the same results, so either the new meta ID field, if it didn't exist and therefore was added, true on a successful update or false on failure. So this is an interesting thing to note. It is possible, and I'm going to do this in a second. In fact, let me let me do this first. Let me show you this. I'm going to call meta ID equals update metadata post seven location. And I'm going to actually go, I'm not going to go location. I'm going to go city. Actually, no, let's go state. And I'm going to say state is California. So this is using update metadata, not add metadata. Um, I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to run this code. So I'll get back to this in a second if you want to see it. But there we go. I've called update, but I did I didn't say to it update an existing one with state because state, if you remember, we haven't added yet against this post type. WordPress will check is does there is there a meta key with state, and if it doesn't, it'll actually then go and add it for you. So this is an interesting an interesting one because you'll often see in plugin or theme code, folks will receive some data from the user somewhere. And, and, and metadata is supposed to be stored. And then they'll just call update because update will either update an existing one with location as the key or all of them if there's multiple. If it doesn't exist, it will go ahead and add it. What I prefer to do if I know that I'm expecting certain types of metadata is I will have some kind of plugin initialization function that fires when the plugin is first installed or some theme initialization function when the theme is first installed. And I will add those metadata keys with an empty value to begin with against the post. Uh, or when the post is, if I'm expecting the post the first time, I will check has it been added and then I will add it. Um, you don't have to do it that way. It is nice that the update does it for you. So if you just call update and it doesn't exist, it will add it for you. It really depends on your personal preference there. But calling updates and passing in a key and a value that doesn't exist against that post ID will create the record for you. It will obviously also update the record. So let's say I change location to San Francisco like I wanted to. Let's go back to the code. So we'll change this to location. And we'll say San Francisco. If I then run this, and let's change this back to updated, then it will specifically, it should just update ID 9. So let's test that. All right, it's updated with ID 1. Oh, that, oh, hang on. What have I done wrong here? Let's have a look. I've done something wrong. It has updated it correctly, but it's passed in a pass back a one for some reason. I don't know if I've done something wrong in my code somewhere. Um, oh, wait, wait, wait. I know what I've done wrong. <laughs> if it's if it's a successful update, it'll return true, not the ID. Um, and if you if you if you render a true Boolean in HTML, it renders a one. So that's what the difference is there. So be aware of that change. When you're updating something, it'll only give you the ID if the key didn't exist. It'll pass true if it was a successful update and false if there was a failure. And so you need to check against those options when you're working with this code. If all of that doesn't matter to you and you just want to make sure that it was added, then you can do something like this. And you can say, if not met the ID, because true would pass as false and a valid one or two or nine or whatever a number would be a true value. So you would say, if not met ID, then you can echo 
an error occurred. And then otherwise you can say the metadata record was updated, or at least you can store that it was updated, but you can't necessarily rely on the ID. You could do a check. You could do something like this. You could say, I'm diving a bit of a tangent here, but bear with me. You could say, if uh, is numeric, I think it is. Yes, you can call the is numeric function. And then you can check that on the ID. So on the meta ID. Um, so now if it's a numeric, that means it was added. Uh, record added. Hang on, I've left out something there. Um, otherwise you will say it has been um, updated. Okay, and this is one of the reasons why some developers prefer it when a function just returns one type of variable, so not an integer or a true or a false, because then you don't have to do all this kind of checking if you want to um, return some information to the user. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna copy this out um, so that you can see that code if you want to. I see there was a comment in the chat, um, so there we go. Elliot says, "Why didn't all location keys get updated?" That's a good question. So. Let's have a look at specifically the location keys that we have. Let me refresh this. So we've got three location keys. Two of them are tied to ID one. And because I passed in post ID seven, it ignored those. There is only one location key here tied to ID seven. The other one is, is stored as state. So it only found that one. However, that brings up a good point. Let's add a new location just to show you what that looks like. I'm gonna do it manually in the data. Uh, and then I'm gonna show you what would happen? So let's add another post ID seven. Let's add another location meta key. And let's say the location was downtown or something. I don't know San Francisco, but I've heard the word downtown related to San Francisco. Um, so let's store that as a secondary location. And now let's look at what the data is. So for post ID seven, we've got location San Francisco, we've got location downtown. If I want to only update location San Francisco, I need to pass in San Francisco as the previous value. If I just say update post ID seven location to, I don't know, a random other city, uh, Los Angeles in California, Los Angeles. Now it's going to update all of them. Let's test that. Okay, it's been updated. Let's refresh the data. And there you go. Both the first one and the second one have been updated to Los Angeles. So if you know you're storing more than one metadata key with the same key value, make sure you pass in the previous value so it updates the correct field. Okay. <laughs> Elliot says, what if there were multiple location keys? And then he says, you're ahead of me. <laughs> but I'm glad you asked Elliot because it allowed me to go down that path. And it's important because it comes up just now. Um, okay. So that's adding and updating. The other one we want to be able to do is we want to be able to fetch the data before we delete it. So this is where we want to fetch it for a front end somewhere. Um, I'm not going to break, but if you have questions, you're welcome to give them in the chat. I want to make sure we cover everything today. So if it, does anybody want to guess if you can add and update metadata, what would the function be to get metadata? <laughs> the answer is quite simply get metadata. Um, and, this, and this will apply through all of WordPress. Generally, you will see things like add, uh, update and get, and then the type of data that you're receiving. So that function is called get metadata. Um, it also has specific parameters. Again, the post type is the first required parameter. Um, the object ID is the second parameter. And the meta key is the third parameter. And then there's a single parameter, which if it's true, return only the first value of the meta key. Otherwise, if it if if you don't specify it, sorry, it says the parameter has no effect if meta key is not specified. Meta key, you'll notice, is optional. So let's go through the different options here based on the required parameters and the optional parameters, starting with just the required parameters. So I'm going to just call this data, and I'm going to say get metadata post ID seven. That's all I want to do. I just want to get all the metadata stored on post ID seven. And then I'm going to use a PHP function called printr um, with some HTML tags that look like this, PRE tags, pre-formatted tags. This is a great way of formatting a printr function call. 
when you want to have a look at data that you don't know what it's going to be, whether it's going to be an array or a string or anything like that. Um, when I first started working in PHP, I used this a lot. <laughs> okay, so that's it. So data equals get the metadata for post ID seven, and then echo that out on screen. So that's the code we're going to use. Let me just pop that in the chat so you all can see that. I saw your question about serialized strings. I'll get to that in a second, Elliot. So let's see what that does. Okay, I'll have to make this a little bit bigger so that we can see it because it doesn't make it. I don't know why am I? Oh, I'm using. Okay, sorry, folks. I'm using command and the scroll button, but it's command plus. Let's make it 150. There we go. So notice that there are quite a few meta keys stored on this post. The first one is the edit lock. You'll notice it has an underscore in front of it. Those are what are called hidden custom fields or hidden meta keys. And you will notice that they don't appear. If I go to the howdy field, they don't appear in the custom fields meta box. That's because they have that underscore in front. So that's another way you can, James, getting back to your question earlier about private data. If you store meta keys with an underscore in front of the key name, it doesn't show up in the custom fields. Again, hash it or store it in a secure way if you need it to be secure, but it's a way of sort of hiding that data from the average user. WordPress uses this for certain things. So in this case, the edit lock is a field that is set when somebody is working on a post. And it's how WordPress knows that another user is using a post. So if another user logs into the site, it's how WordPress knows to give that little message to hey, so-and-so user with such and such ID is working on this post. Um, I'm not sure what Enclose Me does. Uh, I'm sure if I went and searched it in the documentation, I would find it, but th there it is. There's also the edit last meta key that's stored. And then here are our custom meta keys that we created. So the first one is location. And you'll see it fetches the two values in an array. So it gets the location key, even though they are, look, if you look at the database, there, there are two separate records in the database. It returns them as one array. And then it returns state as another meta key and then an array as well. And the first item is the item in that uh, value. And the reason it does this is because you can store multiple uh, meta keys, sorry, meta values on the same key. And that's why it returns an array. So if you just, first of all, if you just want to get back a specific key, you would pass in the key in this get metadata function. So let's just go for location for this one. <clears throat> and let's refresh that. Okay, and there is location. Now, the reason it's returning an array is not because there are two. That is the default. It always returns an array. Let me show you what I mean. If we go and look for state um, and we refresh that code, it returns California in an array. The first item in the array is California, even though it's just one record in the database. The reason it does that is because there could be multiple and the WordPress code base doesn't know whether there's multiple keys or not. So it just always returns an array. But let's go back to the location one. If I just want to get one value, then I can return single. Sorry, I can pass in a value for single and I can say true. And if I now call this code, it'll just return the first one it finds just as a single piece of text, not in an array. So if you are working with now, the, the, the recommendation is unless you really want to have multiple values on the same key, which is generally not a good idea because then you have to work through the array. Generally, you would store just location and then maybe city and then maybe state and then different values on those. But if you want to get those back as a single value, you must always pass true as that single parameter. So it becomes, when you're working with metadata, when you're fetching metadata, passing true as that fourth parameter becomes something that you that you do by default, especially if you want to display it on the front end. Um, Elliot says, I've seen serialized strings added to a single key. Is that an accepted method? So let's talk about that very quickly. This wasn't on my plan for today, but it's a good thing to cover. I can take an array of data or an object, data object. So let's create a very simple array. So we'll say array equals, and I'm old school, so I use the old school array method. And let's say we're storing an array of values, um, I don't know, days of the week maybe. So we'll say Monday, Tuesday, so on and so forth. I'm just going to store Monday to Wednesday for now. And then I'm going to say meta ID equals, and I'm going to cheat by using update metadata because <laughs> it will add for me. Update metadata 
I want to store it on the post. I want to store it on post ID seven. I'm going to call it uh, days of the week, just DOW. And then I'm going to pass in just that array as is. I'm going to do nothing else to the array. So I'm not doing any kind of special formatting or anything else. And then I'm just going to say, I'm just going to keep it simple. I don't expect it to fail. So I'm going to echo done, finished. <laughs> so I want to show you what this does when I run this code. Um, so an array, if you've never seen an array in, in programming before, it's a collection of variables. If I run this code, it's done. Let's go and see what's sitting in the metadata. So by default, if you pass an array to a meta value, it will do what is known as serialization. So it takes the array or the object, it serializes it into a string and stores it as what's known as a serialized string. Um, this is a this is a common thing in I can't get this thing to stay big, so I'll just drag it there. This is a common thing in programming. It can take an object or an array and convert it into a string version, which is known as a serialized string. And then when you fetch this data, so let's do the fetch. Uh, I'm just going to comment this out for now. I want to show you what happens. So let's say data equals get metadata. And it was post and it was ID seven. And the key was days of the week. And then let's, I'm actually just gonna grab from my test code here, the print R stuff. Uh, it's down here somewhere, here we go. Just easier than typing it all out again. <laughs> um, there we go, print R data. Show you what happens. There we go. Notice how it's an array within an array. So if I were to pass in single, I would get the original array back. I wouldn't get a single value. I would then have to traverse through that array if I wanted a specific day. So it is possible to do that. Um, <clears throat> you can store serialized strings if you want to store data objects like that. You just need to remember when you get them back, they're going to be an array with an array. If you pass single, if I change this to single, then I'll just get the array on its own. Um, no, it's not single, true. <laughs> true to single. So let's do that. But I still get the original array. So it takes whatever the original data was that was stored, in this case an array, and returns that original data. I can't just get the first value from there. I would then have to use some array functionality uh, in PHP to get the first item if that's what I wanted. Okay, uh, James says, if we wanted to target multiple cities, okay, I think I've covered that. Uh, Elliot says, var dump with FT bug, that's another option. Uh, there's many ways to, to get the data out there. Okay, and then finally, I'm not gonna ask you to guess. I think we all know what the delete metadata function is going to be. Uh, it is going to be delete metadata. So let's have a look at that. Um, delete metadata has some additional options on it as well. So the first one is, again, string type. In other words, post uh, comment term user. Object ID, again, is required. Meta key is required. Meta value is optional. I'm not going to code this. But meta value is optional because maybe I want to delete all the keys, all the values against that key. I can just pass in the key, and it'll delete them all. So if I just say delete metadata post seven location, it'll delete both of those. If I specify the value as, for example, Los Angeles, in this case, it'll delete both anyway because we've changed it. But if this one was still San Diego or whatever it was, it would just delete the Los Angeles one. Um, but then you also have an option for delete all. So if this is true, delete matching metadata entries for all objects, ignoring the specified object ID. I've never had to use that optional um, parameter, but it does exist. So you can, you can probably pass in null for the object ID call the location meta key and say delete all and it'll delete all the location meta keys and values against posts across the site. Okay, I'm not gonna code that now because I think we all know what that's gonna look like. I wanted to stop and just check if there are any questions around all of that uh, before I move on to a very quick note on the metadata wrapper functions because we have five minutes left. <laughs> Okay, there don't seem to be any questions, so let's dive straight into that. If you have been working with WordPress for a while, 
you will know that there are what are known as metadata wrapper functions, or at least that's what I call them, um, where you can add metadata for specific uh, object types. So for example, for posts, you have an add post meta, update post meta, get post meta, and delete post meta functions. You'll notice that those parameters are post ID key value, and then the same additional values. So for add, it's unique. For update, there'll be previous value. For delete, et cetera, et cetera. These wrapper functions essentially call the add, update, get, and delete functions that we just discussed underneath. But it's a shorter way of working with specific object types. So if you're working with posts or pages or any other custom post type and you want to work with metadata there, you can just use the add, post, update, post, get, post, and delete post meta functions. If you're working with uh, comments, same story. You can go add comment meta. Um, can't spell <laughs> comment meta. Again, add comment meta, update comment meta, get comment meta, delete meta. Same for users. Um, add user meta, update user meta, get user. It's all it's all the same throughout the whole WordPress code base. So that's great because then you are making your life easier. You're writing shorter code because you can leave out that object name. Um, if you look at the number of letters, add post meta um, and add metadata are about the same. So that's about the same, but you don't have to worry about what type you're storing against. And so you know that's what you're working with at every single time. There's nothing wrong with using the core add metadata functionality. Um, I just prefer to use the ones that are the wrappers because then I know I'm specifically working with that type and I never have to worry about making a mistake in that bit of code. Okay. That is my bit for today. Does anybody have any other questions about the Metadata API? Is there anything that they felt that they wanted to learn today that I didn't cover uh, or anything else before we, before we wrap up for today? Okay, Jose says, please cover the meta field creation. I assume you mean the meta boxes, um, which yes, I definitely am going to cover that. So to, I'm not going to do it soon, um, but to give an idea, I, I, I'm, I'm going to share this with you very quickly. Um, there's two there's two things that I want to cover on, under that topic. I just want to find the, the post. Um, oh, wait, I'm searching in the wrong place. Sorry, folks. Uh, so the fun the fun thing about these sessions is I have to first cover the metadata API before I can talk about meta boxes. So this is one of those uh, we do this one now and then we do the other one another time. Uh, I'm not going to find the post that I want now, am I? Um, hang on, let me let me try and search. What I'm searching for is there is a there is a post on the training team blog. Um, wait, hang on. Uh, that covers all the topics that I'm busy working through. Um, here we go. So this post is basically covering all of the topics that I'm working through at the moment. Uh, you will see that one of the sections, if we scroll down here, one of the sections, section eight, is an introduction to all the common WordPress APIs, which is what I'm currently working through. Um, when I do, I'm going to come back to WordPress plugins. And probably in the introduction to WordPress plugins, I'm, you see there, there's a section on using post meta. So when I get around to that topic, then I will do a session on that. Uh, so it is coming. Uh, I just, uh, I need to get through a whole bunch of other things as well. So I'm doing the introduction. I'm doing this whole section first. So far, we've done images, dashboard widgets, the database. We haven't done the file system yet. We did global variables a couple of weeks ago. Today is metadata. Next, I'm probably going to be doing the HTTP API. Uh, options and settings after that. Then we'll need to do rewrite shortcode and transients. And then when I finished all of that, then I'll probably swing back and we'll start looking at probably plugins or themes. Um, so that content is coming, bear with me. Um, and, and do keep an eye on this post because as I update, as I create new tutorials, I, I update the links there. Um, awesome. That is my bit for today. I want to thank you everybody for joining me. Uh, please do dive into the documentation about the metadata API, about creating meta boxes, about how this all works. Um, if you have only ever used custom fields in the WordPress post edit screen or something like advanced custom fields, I recommend understanding the, the underlying functionality. 
The main reason I recommend that is because if you're working on a site that has, that requires maybe one or two custom fields, it's often a lot easier and a lot less uh, overhead on your site to code it yourself in a plugin. As you saw, it's fairly simple to add and update meta fields and get the data from the meta field, as opposed to installing a thing like tool set types or advanced custom fields. I'm not saying don't use those plugins. I, they are very useful plugins. Um, but I like to, whenever I'm looking at a project, I like to go, well, how many meta fields am I going to use? And how much overhead will I be adding if I install a plugin that allows me to do everything, but I'm just doing one or two things. So it's always good to understand how the underlying functionality works. Um, even if you never use it, it's just good to know what it does. Awesome. Thank you all for joining me. Um, it has been, it has been as always amazing to interact with you all. Uh, have a great rest of your Thursday and the rest of your week, and I'll see you all next week. Bye-bye.